with Josh backing out. Uh, we were disappointed. Unquestionably, we were disappointed and surprised. The old assistants, though, as Belichick still searches for McDaniels. This also tells me Josh McDaniels is still the snake that everybody thought he was. All we're trying to do is win a game. On February 6, 2018, Patriots offensive coordinator Josh McDaniels agreed to become the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. The team announced the hiring and an introductory press conference was scheduled to take place in Lucas Oil Stadium. The next day, McDaniels called Colts GM Chris Ballard. He went back on his word. He would not become the Colts head coach. As news of McDaniels backtracking became public, one word kept coming up. Snake. Anyone who remembered Josh McDaniels' time with the Denver Broncos was quick to point out that this was not a one-off. This was who Josh McDaniels was as a coach and a person. Are the Raiders getting a coach who sabotaged the Denver Broncos in 2009? Are they getting a changed man to lead their franchise? Or perhaps they're getting what everyone has seen. This is the story of the NFL's biggest snake. My father was a uh, uh, head football coach, high school football coach. Um, he's a legend in Ohio. Uh, he didn't like me to say that, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about that. Joshua Thomas McDaniels was born in 1976 in Barberton, Ohio, just a 30-minute drive from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. His dad, Tom McDaniels, was a high school football coach in Ohio, a legendary one at that. Coach McDaniels brought Josh to practices at McKinley High School in Canton. From the age of five, Josh slept with a football, watching his dad coach every day, knowing one day that would be his life. By the time he was in high school, McDaniels hardly cut the figure of a star athlete. Standing 5'8", 155 pounds, he was far from a prototype passer. But McDaniels commanded respect in McKinley's huddle as their starting quarterback and place kicker. As the Bulldogs QB, there was only one objective, beat rival Massillon. On November 5th, 1994, 20,000 fans packed the stadium to see one of the fiercest rivalries in high school football. Sports Illustrated writers attended the game. It was a back and forth affair, knotted up 35 all and headed to overtime. McDaniels marched his team down the field and into the end zone. McKinley took the lead. Now lining up to kick the extra point, McDaniels tugged at his right shoe, swung his leg and missed. Massillon answered with a touchdown drive of their own and their kicker sent the game-winning field goal right down the pipe. In mere seconds, McDaniels had gone from hero to goat but he took the failure in stride. Later in the same season, McKinley reached the playoffs and met Massillon once again, the 101st game in the series. This time it was the Bulldogs who pulled away in the final minutes. With his team down one point in the fourth quarter, McDaniels tossed a 46 yard touchdown to Mark Thews. McKinley won and 15 years later, McDaniels would hire Thews as a head coach in Denver. After a collegiate career as a backup QB at John Carroll University, Josh McDaniels capitalized on a connection between his father and Nick Saban to land a gig as a graduate assistant for the Michigan State Spartans in 1999. Two years later, McDaniels got a call from the New England Patriots. It was Bill Belichick offering him a job as a low-level scout for the Pats, a team fresh off a 5-11 season. I'm sure the call went like this. Hey, Josh, would you like to coach As the Patriots evolved from lovable underdogs into a full-fledged dynasty, McDaniels quickly worked his way up the totem pole in Foxborough. Scout, offensive assistant, then quarterback's coach. Finally, when Charlie Weiss left, McDaniels filled his shoes as offensive coordinator, but not his shirt. He would be calling plays for Tom Brady. It wasn't until 2007 that McDaniels had mastered his own playbook. That year, the Patriots offense scored an NFL record 589 points. Tom Brady and Randy Moss set single season touchdown records. New England won 18 games in a row to start the season. How did that end though? 2007 was one thing, but it was the next season that proved McDaniels true showcase as an up and coming offensive mind. 
Tom Brady blew out his knee in week one, ushering in Matt Castle, who hadn't started a game at quarterback since 2000, when he was a senior in high school. None of that mattered. McDaniels guided Castle to a 10-5 record under center, throwing for nearly 3,700 yards and 21 touchdowns. The Patriots missed the playoffs despite winning 11 games, but that free time in January gave McDaniels a head start for interviews, this time as a head coach. His rise to the big time had begun. I know I talk about sports on this channel, but there's one thing I don't talk about enough, that's game. And let me tell you, before today, I had zero wallet game. Not lying, I've been carrying around loose credit cards and cash, just asking to lose it. But not anymore. Introducing the Ridge Wallet. Look how sleek and compact this thing is. Fits in any pocket easily and holds your essentials. Up to 12 cards and plenty of room for cash. Like anyone uses cash anymore. I love this thumb cutout here. It makes accessing my cards so much easier. There's over 30 colors and styles to choose from, including the one I have here, carbon fiber, and there's also burnt titanium. Plus, they come with a lifetime guarantee. So after this video, head on over to ridge.com forward slash five points and use code five points to get 10% off your order. Yes, click the link below or visit ridge.com forward slash five points. And again, use code five points to get 10% off your order. You can even try it for 45 days, and if you don't like it, you can send it back for a full refund. Be like me, step up your wallet game. Rich. You know, <clears throat> when I went to Denver, um, you know, I, I, I knew a little bit of football. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really know people. In February of 2009, Broncos tight end Nate Jackson sat down in Josh McDaniels' office. Jackson had been in Denver since 2003, McDaniels just one month. The head coach was just three years older than his tight end. McDaniels talks about his philosophy and his plans for the team, but he doesn't make eye contact with Jackson. He doesn't laugh at his jokes either. A few weeks later, Jackson received a voicemail at his parents' house. The Broncos had cut him. Jackson phoned McDaniel's office, but the coach was busy in a meeting. He would call him back, McDaniel's secretary told him. Nate Jackson never received a phone call from Josh McDaniels. After seven years in Denver, Jackson was ghosted. 13 years later, Josh McDaniels acknowledged that he knew football when he got to Denver, but he didn't know people. That may have been an understatement. After a three-game skid to end the 2008 season, the Broncos parted ways with head coach Mike Shanahan, the two-time Super Bowl champion who had been the head man in Denver since Josh McDaniels had been a senior in high school. Shanahan's successor was two decades younger. Like they had done with Shanahan in 1995, the Broncos gave McDaniels full control of personnel, and he wielded that power immediately. McDaniels inherited a 26-year-old pro bowler at quarterback. This was not the Jay Cutler as we know him today. Don't care. This was an ascending star at the most valuable position in sports. Cutler possessed immense talent, and he knew it, once remarking that he had a stronger arm than John Elway. His new head coach was equally cocksure in his abilities. It was clear that the two would butt heads right off the bat. On the first day of free agency, an unlikely team lit a powder keg. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers proposed a three-way trade between them, the New England Patriots, and the Denver Broncos. It went like this. New England would receive a second round pick from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Broncos receive Matt Castle, and the Buccaneers would receive Jay Cutler. Castle's agent leaked the trade talks and Cutler caught wind of the negotiations. The Broncos denied the rumors, but Cutler was still hurt, angry even. This prompted a phone call between Cutler and McDaniels in which the quarterback wanted a vote of confidence from his new head coach. Instead, Cutler heard these words from McDaniels. Anyone can be traded at any time. When he said that he didn't know people, McDaniels meant that shit. He treated his franchise quarterback with the same respect as his reserve tight end, which is to say, no respect. The trade fell apart and Castle went to Kansas City, but that didn't salvage the relationship between Cutler and McDaniels. A trade was now inevitable. The only question was where. McDaniels and the Broncos landed on Chicago as their final trade partner. Why? Because the Bears were willing to give two first round picks and the missing piece. 
Kyle Orton. Orton's first win as a Bronco was a miracle that nearly gave Gus Johnson a heart attack. The next three wins were defensive slugfest, but Orton had done his part, not throwing a single interception through the first quarter of the season. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Jay Cutler had thrown four interceptions in his Bears debut. Josh McDaniels was beginning to look like an authoritarian genius in the mold of his mentor. Good job, Josh. And that mentor was next up on the schedule. The Broncos and the Patriots battled it out in week five, with the Broncos erasing an early deficit. Two Brandon Marshall touchdowns pushed the game to overtime. With the game on the line, Matt Prater kicked a 41-yard field goal. Broncos win. Bill Belichick took the field to shake McDaniel's hand, but the protege did not join the master at midfield. Instead, he was taking a victory lap, pumping his fist in front of the fans at mile high. This would be the height of his coaching in Denver, and maybe his career. After starting 6-0, the Broncos dropped four straight. Not only were they beaten, but they were crushed, losing by a combined total of 90 points. The coach who was pumping his fist after beating the Patriots was now spending his Thanksgiving screaming at his team on national television. All we're trying to do is win a motherfucking game! The first two teams to beat the 2009 Broncos had laid a blueprint for the rest of the NFL. The Ravens and the Steelers had uncovered a very simple truth. Get to Orton and he would fold like a beach chair. McDaniel's prized quarterback was a pure pocket passer with no recourse for when a play broke down. The team also lacked depth. Furthermore, McDaniels failed to adapt veteran players to his scheme, or better yet, he failed to adapt his scheme to veteran players. Tight end Tony Scheffler, a mismatch nightmare for defenses, got phased out of the offense. Ride receiver Brandon Stokely became an afterthought and was replaced by former Patriot Jabbar Gaffney. Eddie Royal, who had caught 91 passes as a rookie in 2008, caught just 37 in McDaniels' offense. Then there was Peyton Hillis, who was later a Madden cover athlete with the Browns. Under Mike Shanahan, Hillis was a revelation in 2008, rushing for five yards per carry. With McDaniels, Hillis got the ball just 13 times? How could that be? According to rumors in the deepest corners of the internet, Hillis attempted to put the moves on a woman in the Denver area who just so happened to be Laura McDaniels. Yeah, Josh McDaniel's wife. It's unclear whether or not Hillis even knew who he was hitting on, but it allegedly cost him a ton of carries in Denver and eventually got him traded to Cleveland in exchange for Brady Quinn. Whatever it was, it was just another sign of Denver's dysfunction. Altogether, the Broncos were a fraudulent squad just waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it did. The Broncos embarked on two separate four-game losing streaks in 2009. After starting 6-0, they finished 8-8. Eight eight. Denver still had an outside shot to the postseason if they could beat the Chiefs at mile high in Week 17. But McDaniels decided to sabotage his team in a new way. The Broncos' best offensive weapon, Brandon Marshall, was late to a training session to work on his hamstring. McDaniels caught wind of the infraction and benched his star wide receiver in a do-or-die game. The head coach also got word that Tony Scheffler was complaining about his usage in the new offense. He too was benched by McDaniels in week 17. In the game itself, the Broncos hung around late, but like their season at large, collapsed down the stretch. Denver became just the third team since 1970 to start 6-0 and miss the playoffs. A year later, they were headed for even more embarrassment. I've been selective, um, maybe to a fault sometimes. Uh, people wanted me to do things uh, a little earlier than maybe I did them. Um, but it was going to take a special place uh, for me to, uh, to really leave where I was. The next time the Broncos met the Chiefs, Denver was just 2-6. and six. Kansas City was 5-3. and three. That Sunday, it didn't matter. The Broncos returned the favor from a season ago and defeated KC by 20 points. As the game ended, Josh McDaniels jogged out to midfield to shake the hand of Chiefs head coach Todd Haley. Todd Haley was referring to an incident two weeks before, an incident that took place all the way across the pond in London, England. Saturday, October 30th, 2010. It's a day before Halloween in London, England, and the San Francisco 49ers are holding a walkthrough in Wembley Stadium. In 24 hours, they'll play the Broncos in front of a raucous crowd of costume-wearing Brits. 
but there's someone already watching from above and he's standing behind a camera. Looking down at the 49ers through the aperture is Steve Scarnecchia, the son of legendary Patriots offensive line coach Dante Scarnecchia. The younger Scarnecchia had been in New England for the first three Super Bowl wins by Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. It was him taping opposing teams' walkthroughs in a scandal that was later dubbed Spygate 2. Denver had the 49ers' signals on tape. In theory, they may have known what plays were coming. The Broncos still lost. 24 to 16. According to an NFL investigation, Scarnecchia had taped a six minute video of the walkthrough and presented the tape to McDaniels that same day. According to McDaniels, he did not look at the tape. Regardless, McDaniels waited a full nine days to notify Broncos executives, who quickly reported the violation to the NFL. Denver quickly fired Scarnecchia, and the NFL handed down fines of 50,000 to both the Broncos and to McDaniels personally. It was the biggest embarrassment in a series of compounding embarrassments. Eight days after being penalized by the NFL, the Broncos fired Josh McDaniels after a four-point loss to, who else? The Kansas City Chiefs. He finished his Denver career with a record of 11-17, including 17 losses in the last 22 games. As for Haley and McDaniels, they hugged at midfield. Let the darkness began. It took Josh McDaniels another seven years to get a job as an NFL head coach. One of those seven years was spent as an offensive coordinator in St. Louis where he called plays for a Rams offense that scored 12 points per game. Those other six years were spent back in New England where McDaniels helped the Patriots win two more Super Bowls. Then the phone rang. It was the Indianapolis Colts. They wanted to hire Josh McDaniels to fill their head coaching vacancy left by Chuck Pagano. After a successful interview, the Colts extended the offer and McDaniels said yes. They even announced a press conference at Lucas Oil Stadium. McDaniels even had a suit picked out for the occasion. Then something happened. With Josh backing out, uh, we were disappointed. Unquestionably, we were disappointed and surprised. Um, we had agreed to contract terms. Um, we had an agreement in place. We followed all the rules, did everything right. The evening before he was set to be introduced to the media, McDaniels backed out of his verbal agreement with the Colts. Instead, he was going back to New England to resume his position as offensive coordinator. There were a couple reasons why McDaniels got cold feet, at least as far as we know. First, McDaniels became uncomfortable with how football operations were run in Indy, the logistical side of the job. Ultimately, McDaniels and Colts general manager Chris Ballard struggled to come up with a workable solution to delegating responsibilities. Then, of course, there was the rumor that Patriots owner Robert Kraft had come to McDaniels at the last minute, convincing him to stay in Foxborough and become their heir to Bill Belichick. According to reports, Belichick had also offered to include McDaniels in roster decisions and involved him in the inner workings of the New England Patriots organization. Not to mention, there was a bit of a raise too, an assurance that McDaniel's children could attend the same schools for the next few years. After McDaniel's broke the news to Chris Ballard that he was out, Ballard was pissed and blindsided. In his anger, the Colts GM went out and hired Frank Reich, the Eagles offensive coordinator who had just defeated McDaniel's Patriots in the Super Bowl just a few days earlier. McDaniels didn't just catch heat from the outside, it also came from his inner circle. His longtime agent, Bob Lamont, dropped McDaniels as a client. According to Lamont, McDaniels was committing professional suicide. It turns out that was wrong. A wise man once told me that when you're young, you try to accumulate and advance, and when you get older, uh, you figure out that it's a lot more about serving and impacting others, and I think I've gone through both phases. During the 2011 lockout, Josh McDaniels had plenty of time to spend by himself. McDaniels was in St. Louis, his players weren't allowed at team facilities, and his wife and kids were still in Colorado, finishing out the school year. Only a couple months had passed since the Broncos let him go. The first person Josh McDaniels called after he lost his job in Denver was his father, Tom. His dad gave him one piece of advice. Write down everything you would do differently if you got another chance to be a head coach. Josh took the advice and started an Excel document titled Lessons Learned. He gathered reflections from his own experience, from his father, even from his former rival, 
Tony Dungy. There are hundreds of lessons on that Excel sheet, but here are some of the big ones. Be patient, not impulsive, with decisions. That one he picked up from the Jay Cutler trade. Clean up your language. All we're trying to do is win a mother bleeping game. Wouldn't have made for a famous soundbite. Listen to others. Maybe Tony Scheffler, Eddie Royal, and Brandon Stokely knew something he didn't. My way or the highway got McDaniels shipped out of town. Josh McDaniels will get a chance to put those lessons to work in Las Vegas, where he was hired as the head coach in January of 2022. Redemption is hard to come by in football. McDaniels earned redemption in high school when he beat the Massillon Tigers. He'll have the chance to do it again. He'll also have Devontae Adams. Who knows whether he'll work out in Las Vegas, however a time-honored fable may give us some insight. When a young woman once found a snake near death and brought it into her home, she nursed it back to health. Once healthy again, the snake bit her. When she asked why, the snake only said one thing. When you brought me in, you knew I was a snake. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please not forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Five Points Vids, and you made it to my next video.